Hello, and welcome to this week's movie math. Well, wow, 55.1. That's half of what it needed to do, and it's significantly lower than even the kindest of projections. Some of the trades were almost a, or an hour or more late to even call this, because I'm sure Warner Brothers was the, I mean, what was Warner Brothers, where are they looking for change, in their sofas? Like, this is the number. Oh my gosh, wow. And you know who's laughing right now in Hollywood? Mr. Dwayne Johnson. While James Gunn is probably wondering if he's been handed the keys to a lemon. Uh, and also whether or not maybe he should keep his mouth shut. Did he really have to make Andy Muschietti the official director of Batman Brave and the Bold the Thursday night when it opened? He didn't even get any traction for the headline. And now, just a few days later, look at this box office, box office and audience score. This movie has no redeeming qualities from a business perspective. I really, you know, James Gunn's been all like, I'm the master creative person, but it's like he wanted a business role, yet he refuses to put his business hat on. Uh, and also James Gunn was like, Blue Beetle is the first official character of the DC universe that I'm building. Is he? What if that movie bombs? How are you gonna walk that back? And why even say it? I don't think anyone's falling for these statements. You know, James Gunn is not the influencer that I think he thought he was. Uh, at least not in the DC space, probably because, you know, a lot of DC fans are upset with them. Uh, it's just, it's nuts. Stop making these statements and maybe slow down on Superman Legacy. Uh, he vouched so hard for The Flash. I liked it too, I liked it too. But then it got these results. Gunn has got to be nervous that maybe he doesn't get DC as well as he did Guardians of the Galaxy. I mean, the least he can do is spread around the, uh, the liability. He's taken full responsibility for Superman Legacy. The last time someone did that in the DC space, it was Patty Jenkins, and look how that turned out. Oh, I know, James Gunn fired her, or oh, they parted ways. Oh, she's busy right now. She's not gonna do this movie forever. <laughs> Cause you know, that's how Gunn likes to do it. He doesn't like to actually fire anyone. Uh, he better be careful that Zazie doesn't come up with something for him. And if Gunn's nervous, he can't even tweak his Superman script until the writer's strike is over. Slow it down, Gunn. You don't see Feige talking to anybody, really. Although, they're having problems there, too. All right, so, uh, it's rough out there right now. Now, speaking of nervous, Zazie also thought The Flash was a great movie. And again, I do, too. Uh, but now, maybe Zazie should have taken another tax write-off. This is shocking. There's so much going on here, we're going to have quite the conversation. Um, but I think maybe Zazie should have taken the tax write-off. It would have been even bigger. Blue Beetle and Aquaman 2 have got to be sweating bullets right now that they're going to get an express ticket to, to Max. And at the very least, they shouldn't expect big advertising campaigns. Why send more money after bad? Although some are claiming that the lack of PR, a PR campaign is what hurt The Flash, with the star unable to do press and the Writers Guild strike shutting down the late night talk shows so that Ben Affleck, Michael Keaton, and Sasha Kaye, and maybe even Andy Muschietti, couldn't make the rounds, even if Ezra, Mel Ezra Miller couldn't. I think it's pretty clear that The Flash is a perfect storm of problems. I mean, I would say maybe that was an issue, but it was one of many. Uh, and before, But before we list them, this episode of Movie Math is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like Michael Keaton's Batman trying to hack into the Russian security system with a flip phone. That's not how we do things today. Why would you use ExpressVPN when you already have a perfectly good internet connection? Like the multiverse, there are multiple reasons. How about services like Netflix? Did you know that every country gets different content? There are thousands more shows than you think, and you're only getting a fraction of what Netflix has to offer. By using ExpressVPN, you can change your online location with just one click of a button. Friends isn't on Netflix? Just switch to the UK like this, and now you have it. How about Goodfellas, or The Shawshank Redemption, or Pulp Fiction? Switch over to Canada and enjoy. Or Japan to watch all the latest anime. You get the point. With ExpressVPN, you get your full money's worth. As for me, I like it for the security. I'm always connecting to Wi-Fi around town, and this added layer of protection keeps all of my online traffic safely encrypted. Uh, whether I'm using my phone at the airport or my laptop at a cafe, I never know who else might be on the same network trying to sniff out and steal my account logins or credit card details. We've all been there. I don't know about you, but I did not enjoy spending an hour on Apple customer service having them try to calm me down. 
they eventually did. Now I, j now I just turn on the app and that's literally it. Their powerful encryption goes to work in the background to keep my data safe. And now you can sign up for ExpressVPN, but get three extra months free, three. Just go to expressvpn.com slash beyond the trailer, link down below to sign up. Sign up today and grab those uh, free extra three months. And thanks again to ExpressVPN for sponsoring today's episode of Movie Math. Now let's break down that perfect storm of DC drama. And I want to start with the problems the movie had before it even opened. Uh, the Flash. The Flash is not a particularly well-known character to the masses. And those casuals who can name check him probably think of him as a character on the CW. And as we, I didn't think the uh, trailers were particularly good either. Uh, as we've been saying, even if somebody thinks the Flash is good, no one's going to believe them. Although I think, you know, clearly from the cinema score, not everyone's going to like the Flash. Uh, it has, I think, limited appeal, unfortunately. Again, like Batman v Superman. Uh, but even people who might enjoy it probably aren't going to give it a whirl in theaters because of the ad campaign that didn't look great and did look a lot like a CW show, as some of my uh, coverage uh, pointed out. Uh, this could potentially, though, be an issue for Blue Beetle as well. That character is an even deeper cut in DC characters. And Marvel is even having the same problem with hyping up fringe characters while ignoring or abandoning the much bigger, more popular characters that people actually want to see. And also, but what about all the Batman, right? I mean, just like Batman props up a lot of comics and animated movies uh, you know, direct, to, direct to streaming, here they thought Batman would prop up this movie as well. Sure, people aren't as familiar with The Flash, but everybody knows who Batman is. But how many people know who Michael Keaton's Batman is or care? That's something else we've been discussing the past few weeks, and it has come to fruition. No Way Home only went back to 20, 2002 with Tobey Maguire. But Michael Keaton's Batman is from 1989 and 1992, uh, and a lot of Batman have come since. Way fewer people feel nostalgic for his version of the character. Indiana Jones, whose last good movie also came out in 1989, looks to be having the same issue. It's just too far back. Had Christian Bale been the Batman of this movie? Good luck. But if he had, that would have probably had more of a No Way Home effect. This is why Deadpool 3 is very well uh, positioned. X-Men The Last Stand came out in 2006. Uh, it was uh, the first, the Fox X-Men were contemporaries with Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man. So it's got that going for it, right? And of course, they've been making Deadpool movies for a while now and Wolverine movies with Hugh Jackman. His last one was just in 2017. So very fresh in people's minds still. Then early screenings. Oh, we thought this might bite them in the butt and bite them in the butt it has. They had so many early screenings uh, that some people saw it multiple times in early screenings. I know some of you did uh, for free. Heck, even a lot of the press got to see the movie early at CinemaCon in April. Freaking April. Sony kept that No Way Home close to the vest. And that way it exploded when it finally hit the box office. Now, some people are saying, what about all the leaks? Even the Muschettis are claiming the leaks are what did them in. But, the, you know, no dice. No Way Home was the leakiest movie ever. In fact, it was the first truly big leak movie. But Sony did not, nor anyone associated with No Way Home, confirm any of those leaks. Whereas Andy Muschietti and company confirmed multiple leaks in advance of release and really had no choice because, again, they started showing the film to press and fans starting in April who, and fans, you know, fans aren't, uh, you know, press and critics will pay attention most of the time to an embargo. But fans, they just put all that stuff online. They don't care. They, they're not, they have, don't have any responsibilities. Showing a movie early to fans is extremely risky, especially if it has spoilers in it. Although I will say that I feel pirated clips online and social media uh, are out of control for many movies, especially movies that have a hate campaign against them. And there are some that are motivated for it to fail, both in uploading the clips and watching the clips. Quantumania, The Little Mermaid, and now The Flash, I think were all targeted to this degree and suffered considerably. You can see almost the entire movie, certainly the big momentous moments, online. Even if you're not looking for them, that's how, I mean, it used to be you had to dig for this stuff. Now it's like floating to the top, uh, as, you know, because it gets clicks. Ezra Miller. I do believe Miller kept a significant pu a number of people from seeing this film. Some more liberal moviegoers were likely put off by Miller's breakdown and the accusations against them. While some more conservative moviegoers, especially in today's unfortunate and tragic political climate, 
weren't likely to support an LGBT lead. Uh, so I think that that probably had a big effect as well. Then superhero fatigue mixed with multiverse fatigue. Even hardcore fans like myself are like, I, can't, I don't know how many more multiverse stories I can take. Yep, there are too many superhero movies and shows, so much so that they all are starting to blend together. And even superhero adjacent films like Transformers contributes to this problem because they all are borrowing from each other and they're all kind of cut from the same cloth, particularly to normies, you know, mainstream moviegoers who aren't really into these IPs originally, but like the movies, they're like, every movie's the same. No Way Home, Multiverse of Madness, Spider-Verse, and The Flash are all very similar stories. Spider-Verse and The Flash coming out two weeks apart. I tweeted that after I saw Spider-Verse. I was like, what? It's all very sim I think I think they play differently, but you know, I'm a hardcore fan. I'm used to reading a lot of comic books simultaneously. I can differentiate, but a lot of people have not trained their minds to do so. <laughs> Let's hope that there are no more multiverse stories coming up with the exception of Loki season two and what if season two. Come on, Marvel, chill. You are overloading the multiverse space until Deadpool 3, itself a multiverse story, kicks off next summer. And of course, there's the DC drama. And it's not like Gunn and Saffron have stopped the drama. In fact, they've added their own to it. Uh, it's made some fans absolutely hate Warner Brothers in DC, while a lot of other people are just sick of all the drama and want out. Which leads to problems, let's talk, now discuss problems with the film now that it has opened. And as I said, it turns out, a lot of people genuinely don't like it. A B cinema score is a disaster. A lot of you sometimes will be like, I'd be happy with a B on a test. Not if you were trying to like have a, you know, here's the thing. Just at least for cinema scores, most blockbuster films that do well have an A or an A minus. Uh, cause it determines how, how long the, the longevity of the movie at the box office. A B plus is okay, but even then you should start to be a little nervous or, you know, your film's a little controversial maybe, right? If you get a B panic city, the only thing that's immune to this is horror films, which usually get a C, but you know, still can perform quite well. And when horror films are in the B range, hallelujah. But if you get below a B plus and you're a regular movie, that's like scary stuff. That's like, you don't want that. So Quantumania got a B, just to give you some perspective, but so also did Batman v Superman. So I feel The Flash is more of a divisive film, uh, which some people loved and some people hated and some people felt mad about, but you can't argue like James Gunn and David Zaslav and Tom Cruise and Stephen King tried to, that everyone would love it. Uh, you know, it's like what I did when I saw Batman v Superman. I was like, I love this movie, but I acknowledge that a lot of people do not. So what do audiences want from a DC movie? I'm sure that James Gunn is pro I mean, if he's had, if James Gunn was smart, if he had any self-awareness and was willing to, he'd be asking himself that right now. He'd be having, an be having an emergency meeting. So uh, what do audiences want from a DC movie? We know pretty much what they want from a Batman movie, by the way, and this isn't it. So uh, once again, why is Andy Muschietti directing Batman Brave and the Bold? I'm like, they want it like, Nolan and Reeves, that's what they want. And Phillips, they don't want this bright, happy Batman. They've said no. But what about DC overall? Are people even interested in DC stories? I mean, they were for a, for a little bit there, right? Is, but is the brand so damaged at this point with all of the problems? Is it beyond repair or what would it take to repair it? I don't think just throwing more movies at the wall is, uh, is working. They're all sliding down. It's so, so awkward to watch. On the one hand, I think the drama has turned off casual fans. They don't know what's happening with the characters. They don't even know who's playing the characters at this point or what's happening with the brand overall. There's been no clarity. And as I've been saying, they should have done a hard reboot. It just makes it more confusing uh, and not really feel like it's anything different, really. Uh, and then when it comes to hardcore DC fans, once again, where are you when the box office <laughs> opened? Uh, plus though, the DC audience remains incredibly fractured. DC loves to experiment with his characters in different spaces, but the result is they have so many different versions of the characters and the fandom is therefore spread out. Whereas Marvel is pretty much for better or worse on the same page with everything. I mean, they've even ruined their comics over at Marvel to make sure the MCU is what they pay attention to. Although Marvel having plenty of problems, plenty. Watch my uh, secret invasion interview uh, that went up yesterday. Uh, but yeah, if you make one part of the fandom of DC happy, you probably upset all the other ones, so it's a mess. I'd also like to add on this note that this this is this is for Secret Invasion as well. 
You can't use the title or the idea of a beloved comic book story and expect to capitalize on it. In fact, you'll probably end up annoying and uh, 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 mobilizing against you the very fandom that you were trying to appeal to in the first place. Sure, Civil War made a lot of changes, but the core of the story remained the same. Captain America versus Iron Man, heroes divided. And yeah, the Flash movie isn't called Flashpoint, but it's clearly based on that comic. Hollywood creatives, if you want to tell your own story, get your own title. At this point, I honestly believe that the main DCU should just take a break, like Star Wars, but still continue with the Batman and Joker too. I don't even know why they're making Batman Brave and the Bold when they have a Batman 2 coming up. I mean, that's ridiculous. Uh, I'm thinking maybe a five-year break. They might need that much time. What do you think? I mean, with the casting choices that Gunn is considering, he's apparently been auditioning them this weekend, can he really move the needle with those actors? Or like The Flash, is he making the most expensive CW episode ever? I think that might be what's happening. Uh, but hold up. These days, we don't just have DC drama anymore, but we also now have Disney drama. Oh, my goodness. This is, this is so bad as well. And while Elemental has excellent audience scores, great movie. Loved it. Uh, and as you can see, most people loved this movie. But look at this box office. Oh, so it does, this doesn't even have a three in front of it. So much for Pixar proving they deserve theatrical releases. This is an even lower debut than Lightyear, which was a disaster. And Onward, which opened right at the beginning of an actual disaster in, in real life, like the world that mattered, the pandemic. In fact, it's even worse than Peter Soane's first Pixar movie, The Good Dinosaur, which was considered a bad opening weekend. Elemental de Elemental's debut is, is, is in fact tied with the very first Toy Story, which opened in 1995, so you know inflation, for the lowest Pixar opening ever. Oh my gosh. On a more positive, or at least hopeful note, Elemental's debut is in line with Encanto's, which of course went on to become a phenomenon on Disney+, Plus. although a big part of that was the music, and Pixar doesn't do musicals. Disney Live Action apparently doesn't really do musicals either anymore. Uh, they kind of do, they do, uh, but you know, I think the music, Disney, music's a big part of Disney, and they, they should embrace that more. But anyway, anyway, like, <clears throat> like with Encanto, will Elemental get a reprieve on Disney Plus? I think it could, but I, 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 do, I don't feel strongly about it. But I mean, I hope. Uh, and has Disney though trained a large number of its fans not just to watch the Pixar movies on Disney Plus, but all Disney movies on Disney Plus? If you wait about three months. You can basically watch the movie for free. And if it's a box office bomb, even sooner. In fact, when these movies weren't doing well over the weekend, some of you tweeted back to the replies to my, up, my updates on Twitter, yay, this means it'll be on streaming faster. Also, like the superhero marketplace, animation is getting crowded and competitive. Audiences just turned out in huge numbers for Super Mario Brothers and across the Spider-Verse. Meanwhile, here comes Elemental, a totally unknown IP. So much for all of you saying, <laughs> you know, um, uh, people were like, oh, we want more uh, uh, lighthearted DC. It's too serious. Oh, here you go. Oh, you don't want it. Oh, we want more original stories. Here you go. Oh, we don't want it. What? Um, so it's a totally unknown IP. Uh, Super Mario Brothers is, of course, based on the legendary Nintendo video game, while Super uh, Spider-Verse itself, the sequel to a film that did not do well, but now it's a sequel after having built a huge audience on where? Streaming. So streaming sometimes is quite helpful. But uh, Elemental is a, a far less aggressive, quieter, and simpler film, and it's going up against Spider-Verse, which is just in its third weekend. It doesn't even have the animation audience all to itself. Audiences might genuinely be interested in watching Elemental. Is it on your to watch list? But not in a theater at today's prices, especially since they know it'll eventually trickle down to Disney Plus, again, at no extra cost. This is why Bob Iger greenlit Toy Story 5, Inside Out 2, Frozen 3, and Zootopia 3 for theaters. That's gonna move the needle. But where is The Incredibles 3? What else are you doing, Brad Bird? I'll tell you, he's doing nothing. Make Incredibles 3. And I, I liked Incredibles 2, but I hope Incredibles 3 is a scooch better because uh, I think not everybody, again, loved it. Uh, all right, so, uh, or they could get a new director like with Frozen 3. Hmm? I wouldn't do that for Incredibles. I wouldn't do that. I'd maybe just pay a little more attention to uh, Brad Bird's uh, script. And I would age up the kids at this point. I mean, come on. All right, so anyway. 
Then let's address the elephant in the room, that there are too many elephants in the room. All these big movies are coming out back to 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 back. There's no room to promote them. There's no room to discuss them. There's not enough premium screens to support them. The great premium screen bottleneck of summer 2023 is coming up fast. I tweeted about this yesterday with Mission Impossible, Oppenheimer, and Barbie all competing for premium screens, which could end up leaving Barbie with no premium screens. What? And it's hard for any of these movies to have staying power. If you miss it, uh, if, uh, thanks to the overcrowded marketplace and the safety net that digital and streaming now provide, if you don't see these movies opening weekend, a number of people go, heck, at this point, I might as well just wait for digital or streaming. And I, I mean, where you have a lower price point and you can own the film, particularly with the digital release, if you don't want to wait for no extra cost. And on that note, as for the other movies in the marketplace right now, fighting it out, here's the rest of the top 10. Spider-Verse is still going strong, at least domestically, with again, Elemental doing no real damage. This sequel is nearing 300 million domestically, which will make it only the third movie of the year to cross that mark so far. Oh, that's good. But here's something bad, both Transformers, Rise of the Beasts, huge second weekend drop, oh, maybe they won't make that other movie, and The Little Mermaid will not reach, they won't even reach it, much less surpass 300 million domestic. The Blackening also hit theaters this weekend, hoping to capitalize on the Juneteenth holiday weekend. And it did okay, it did okay. Uh, but it had a very good cinema score for a horror film, and it was also able to expand its appeal a bit beyond the black audience. So that's all very promising for when it hits digital and streaming later on. As for Asteroid City and limited release, just six theaters and Wes Anderson's sweet spot, New York and Los Angeles. Uh, the movie had a very strong per theater average, but a horrible audience score on Rotten Tomato. It hasn't gotten a cinema score uh, just yet, and it might not. Uh, the French Dispatch. Wes Anderson movies don't always get cinema scores. But wow, not, look at that Rotten Tomatoes uh, audience score. And that's from Wes Anderson's core fandom, no less. I mean, wow, after this and Bo is Afraid, what's with all these art house directors self-destructing? Yikes. Over on streaming, let's start with Nielsen, per usual, for mid-May. Oh look, here's Quantumania on the overall chart. But not only is it not number one, but when you look at the numbers, it's not even close to the mother, which is it's on its second week on these charts, uh, whereas Quantumania just hit. Three months after it hit theaters, it got to Disney+. Plus. Uh, but look at Ted Lasso, climbed to a season three high, a fourth place on the overall chart. That's very good, particularly for Apple TV. And I think a season four without Jason Sudeikis is looking more and more likely. Uh, but most of this chart is acquired shows, AKA babysitting shows for kids and adults. Uh, so over on the originals charts, another yikes. These numbers are bad, whew. The streamers definitely dropped the ball in May with not enough new content, although maybe that's because they're slowing themselves down to better pace themselves because of the Writers Guild strike. So they're spreading, spreading out their content. Uh, and with its second uh, to last episode over on the acquired chart, Succession rose a bit, just a bit, but it's, it's up a little bit. I'm, I'm curious to see what happens with the season finale next week on next week's charts. While on the movies chart, nothing big happening here either, although it is at least nice to see Dungeons and Dragons on Paramount Plus and Air on Prime Video Place, even if, again, their numbers are just so low. Uh, with Netflix's own charts for just last week, ooh, we've got a new number one as the mother finally dropped after, um, after four weeks at number one to fourth place. Uh, a, a lot of acquired movies this week, though, instead of Netflix originals. Again, perhaps because they've slowed down due to the writer's strike, their, you know, their releases. As for shows, though, there's some good activity here. Netflix did drop the final season of Never Have I Ever, which is doing pretty good, although you can see why it's ending. Uh, same for the final episodes of Manifest. But here's, this is cool, uh, if you're an Arnold fan, Ar uh, Arnold's FUBAR and his documentary. So he's got a one-two punch here are both, you know, doing very, I wouldn't say very strong, but strong numbers. But pretend, potentially he's found a home at Netflix. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Well, I'm wondering when they're gonna announce FUBAR season two. I'm sure Arnold is expensive though. So that might be a bit of an issue. Uh, and there's no cut to give, that's interesting. There's no cut to give him because there's no, uh, on streaming like Netflix, there's, there's no money that's made it past the initial deals. Hmm, no back end to help alleviate the, the the uh, salaries. 
Uh, but, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they announced some kind of movie with him or something because, you know, it's, it's working. As for iTunes, not a lot of surprises here either. Uh, a lot of recent theatrical releases or adjacent, like, you know, the first Spider-Verse movie, uh, as a lot of moviegoers are now content to wait to watch at home. Although it is nice to see BlackBerry still in the top 10, still for the third week in a row now, finding an audience. Hopefully, it will launch a film career for Glenn Howerton. I am now a fan. So many of you have been like, Grace, what about Glenn Howerton? And I was like, get that out of here. But now I'm like, yes, what about Glenn Howerton? Somebody cast him in something. It doesn't have to be a comic book movie. Just give this man more work. He's brilliant. Again, I'm hoping he might get some nominations. Although I don't know if he would be able to compete in the supporting category, which is where I think he'd have the best luck. Aw, oh, man. Uh, I'd say good luck to him in the Golden Globes, but who knows what's going to happen to that? Uh, we'll I'll talk about that on a streaming, uh, on a live stream uh, this week. Uh, all right, so as for this uh, coming week, uh, what's, co what's going to be released? So finally, the box office gets a bit of a breather as only No Hard Feelings opens while Asteroid City goes wide, but again, that audience score, uh, I think that's going to drop like an asteroid falling to the earth. <laughs> Uh, as for, most, you know, maybe no hard feelings could be big, but on the same side, I can see a lot of people being like, boy, does that look like a streaming movie or digital. As for streaming movies, there's just Evil Dead Rise, which finally hits max. That actually didn't take that long on Friday. But with series, here we've got ourselves a party. Oh boy. Tonight, well, just hold on a minute. You, at first you might be like, what kind of lame party is this, Grace? It's going to get much better. So tonight, The Walking Dead, Dead City starts, if you're still a Walking Dead fan. Uh, you might be, feel like you're The Walking Dead. Uh, and The Righteous Gemstones both return to kick off new seasons. Although, there might be some Righteous Gemstone fans out there. I mean, there must. They're on their, like, what, third season? But what a letdown for what airs on Sunday. Although, The Idol didn't do well either. Oh, isn't that still airing? Whoa, Idol and The Righteous Gemstones. What a horrible lineup. Okay. Well, on Wednesday, Secret Invasion drops a first episode on Disney+. Plus. You got to see this thing to believe it. Oh, the chatter that will probably happen on Wednesday. But then Thursday is the big day. This is the big day. And, you know, Secret Invasion is a big deal, even if you maybe won't like it. It's still, you know, it's a big deal. So on Thursday, though, The Bear drops its entire season two on Hulu. Hooray! Thank you also to those of all of you who insisted I watch The Bear. It's so, so good. I'm so excited for Thursday. And just like that, returns as well with two new episodes on Max on Thursday. And then Daddy's Dream Car also debuts. Maybe someone will watch that. And the anime Skull Island drops on Netflix as well. And so that's pretty good, right? That's a party. Come on. The Bear's a party all on its own, quite frankly, in my opinion. Uh, all right. So anyway, that's this week's movie math. What have you been watching? What do you plan to watch? And what are your thoughts on all the continuing DC and Disney drama? Will it ever end? What will it take to make it end? Share those thoughts down below. Subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.